Anti-immigrant protesters fought with police after a stabbing incident involving three young children. A populist turn to the right. The far right is getting stronger in Germany, and the far right party, AFD, is becoming more and more radical. Germany's domestic intelligence service has warned. And when we are dieses Land regieren werden, dann verspreche ich der fragwürdigen Sippschaft da hinten, dann brechen für euch andere Zeitplan. Recently, riots broke out in Ireland's capital city, Dublin. The reason for the protest was anger at country's immigration policy, following a stabbing at a school by a man originally from Algeria. This incident sparked political clashes between the left and the right in Ireland, something that can be seen across Europe. For some time now, immigration has been one of the most polarizing issues in the continent and the group which is opposed to immigration seems to be growing. A few months ago, an anti-immigration party called SVP became the biggest after an election in Switzerland. It doesn't hold a majority in the parliament, but it has received a significant 28.6% of the vote. The same happened in Netherlands one month later in a general election, where the right-wing party for freedom won. The whole campaign of this party was built around the immigration issue which shows just how relevant it has become. In France, the right-wing party National Rally is currently leading in the polls. This is because of massive discontent with the current president Macron, who has a 69% disapproval rating. While the immigration issue isn't the only cause of this, it certainly plays a role. In Germany, we can see the same kind of development with the popularity of the AFD party. This party is the second biggest according to the polls. And getting rid of immigration is one of its biggest talking points. So this issue of immigration is a pretty important one to discuss, as it's a prominent issue in many European countries. Now I realize I may have some inherent biases here considering I come from an immigrant family. So in this video, I'll try my best to stick to facts and studies that have been done by other people instead of sharing my personal opinions. But nevertheless, this video should not be considered as end-all be-all on the immigration debate. Instead, this should be one of many resources when forming your own opinions. Also, like always, before starting, please be sure to hit the like button below. I'm sure to advertisers, immigration is a controversial topic, and YouTube is not a fan of topics that are not advertiser friendly. So your likes help us out a lot. Let's start. The first thing to look at are the actual numbers of migration to Europe. The total population of all EU countries combined is about 448 million. Every year about 2 to 2.5 million people enter the EU from the outside. But the numbers differ dramatically per country, as some countries have attracted more immigrants than others. For example, only 2% of Hungary's population is foreign-born, with most of these foreigners coming from nearby European countries. But in Sweden, the number is 10 times bigger, with 20% of the population being foreign-born. A big group of these immigrants come from war-torn Syria. The average for the European Union was about 12.8% in 2021. In the United Kingdom, this number is about 14.8%. However, the differences are also huge between different regions within those countries. Big cities like London, Paris, or Berlin house way more immigrants than the countryside or smaller cities. In London, for example, more than 40% of the people are not born in the UK. This is true for many urban areas in Europe, which attract most of the people from outside. There is also a huge group of so-called second-generation immigrants in Europe, who are born in Europe but have two foreign-born parents. If you add this group to the figures, the group of non-native citizens become even larger. In general, most of the immigration coming from outside of Europe is from Africa, the Middle East, and Asian countries like India and China. When we are talking about immigration though, there are different kinds of immigration with different root causes. You have study-related immigration, work-related immigration, and asylum-related immigration. In the UK, the biggest categories of immigration are international students and people seeking a job. In 2018, these two categories made up 71% of total immigration. This is the same in many other EU countries because they have high quality universities and a lot of job offerings. Europe is a very attractive destination for people 
from poorer countries. Adding on to this are the extensive social welfare systems that many European countries have. Housing, health insurance, and monthly allowances are provided for the poorest in the society, including some of the immigrants. Critics of immigration say that some of these newcomers just want to benefit from the favorable European system. Others say that it's only fair to give immigrants these benefits because they will help the economy and be net positive. The smallest category of immigration is related to wars and conflicts, like the one in Syria. They are refugees who cannot live safely in their home country. Partly because of the many conflicts in the Middle East, many Arab Muslims have moved to Europe over the last decades. The war in Syria, Iraq, and Libya has displaced millions of people. Because Europe has a lot of opportunities, many of these refugees went to seek asylum in the EU and the UK. In the European Union, which had a very small number of Muslims a few decades ago, it was reported that there were 19 million Muslims in 2010. In a scenario with continued high immigration, this population could reach 75 million by 2050. This is also because of high fertility rates in the Muslim communities. This will be a significant part of the future population, especially because the native population will shrink due to extremely low birth rates. Safe to say, immigration has been a big topic in European politics. But before we look at the upsides and the downsides of immigration, we have to look at its history. One of the key moments was the 2015 migrant crisis, where hundreds of thousands of people tried to cross the EU borders illegally. As a result of an uptick in violence in the Middle East and Africa, many people tried to go to Europe in search of a better life. In a single year, this totaled 1.3 million asylum seekers. 80% of them were fleeing from wars in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. This overflowed the border countries, mainly Italy, Greece, and Hungary, who were receiving the biggest share of the migration. Because the European Union has the freedom of movement, the 2015 crisis was also a tough point for the existence of the Union itself. Every person who enters the Schengen area can travel freely within the territory without further controls. When Italy or Greece accepts migrants, many of them move on to other countries like France or Germany. The United Kingdom was also a popular destination, although it was never part of the Schengen area. As a result, there were many disputes about how many migrants should be let into the EU territory and to which country they should go eventually. Hungary, which is at the eastern flank of this area, was receiving hundreds of thousands of refugees through the Balkan route. Many of the migrants eventually wanted to go to Germany and they needed to cross either Slovenia or Hungary to get there. Now, there are great differences between Western Europe and Eastern Europe when it comes to the public opinion on migrants. In the East, they were very opposed to taking in refugees, while Western countries were in favor of it because of humanitarian grounds. So, the EU lacked a clear policy on the migration issue, which shook it to its core. For some time, there were hundreds of thousands of refugees stuck in Hungary. The poor humanitarian circumstances that these refugees faced sparked outrage all over Europe. Hungary's president, Viktor Orban, didn't like the huge inflow of refugees, so he sent the newcomers to other European countries and he built a border wall. This caused a lot of immigrants to go through Slovenia, another country at the edge of this area. Many of these so-called transit countries were starting to impose their own border controls, which turned out to be a diplomatic mess. Germany stepped in to take in the largest number of immigrants, processing more than 1.4 million asylum applications. This was more than any other country in the EU with France only processing less than 300,000 asylum seekers. Apart from having a large societal impact, there are also huge costs associated with taking in refugees. In 2015 alone, Germany spent more than $20 billion on processing refugees and providing essential services to them. So, some people think it's unfair for Germany to take in more migrants per capita than any other EU countries. However, the former German Chancellor Angela Merkel saw no other option. Because other countries like Hungary and Italy weren't going to take in that many refugees, she felt that Germany had to solve the humanitarian crisis. Her famous sentence was, Wir schaffen das. which means something like, we can manage this. 
but it was clear that the European Union needed to adopt a central policy to prevent this from getting further out of hand. One of the policies that was adopted after 2015 was the controversial EU-Turkey deal. 850,000 of the irregular migrants crossed into EU territory through the Aegean smuggling route, which goes from Turkey to Greece. Most of them were Syrians, who arrived in groups on Greek islands with fragile boats. Many of them didn't want to stay in Turkey because of the few opportunities they have there. With the New Deal, however, Greece could send migrants back to Turkey. For every irregular migrant returned to Turkey, the EU would accept one Syrian migrant to legal routes. Turkey would also try to restrict the flow of migrants to Greece. In turn, the European Union would give Turkey 6 billion euros to improve the situation of Syrian refugees in the country. However, this deal was criticized because it doesn't look at every migrant's individual situation. According to international law, every asylum seeker should be examined individually. But as the EU recognized Turkey as a safe country for refugees, things got complicated. Irregular migrants coming from Turkey have no chance in the asylum process because there's no valid reason to leave Turkey according to EU lawmakers. The deal has been partly successful in the sense that illegal border crossings dropped dramatically. They went from 885,000 in 2015 to about 42,000 in 2017. This meant that Turkey route was effectively closed. But it seemed like it would be open again in 2020 after relations between the EU and Turkey soured over a dispute. Turkey wanted to occupy a part of North Syria to create a safe zone for Syrian refugees. This was because 3.6 million Syrian refugees were living in Turkey, which cost the Turkish government billions of dollars. The EU didn't like the safe zone idea, which President Erdogan responded to by reopening the border crossing to Greece. The Greek authorities responded to this move by forcefully repelling immigrants and suspending the asylum procedures. But all this political back and forth has harmed the refugees. Because of complicated asylum processes and the Turkey deal not fully working, many immigrants wound up stuck in Greece. For years, tens of thousands of people have been living in refugee camps on the Greek islands. The European Human Rights Watchdog described the circumstances there as horrible. There is not enough food, poor hygiene conditions, and not enough access to healthcare. Although the number of people in these camps had decreased significantly over the years, it's rising once again. This is due to the worsening relationship between the Turkish and the Greek government. According to the Greek interior minister, Turkey doesn't take migrants back anymore. To change the status quo, the government in Athens wants to re-energize, rejuvenate, and expand the 2016 deal. But it's not only Greece that experienced large amounts of irregular migration. Italy is also dealing with large amounts of people entering the country by boat. By September 2023, 120,000 people had already entered the country. As you can see from this chart, these extreme levels are similar to 2016. Once again, Italy is experiencing a migration crisis. The Sicilian island is one of the hotspots of this immigration, and it recently received a record 7,000 migrants in just two days. They arrived by boat from North Africa, as the island is located just 90 miles from Tunisia. In general, 50% of boat migrants travel from Tunisia, 37 from Libya, and 12 from Turkey. However, the vast majority of them don't come from these countries themselves. In boats from Tunisia, the majority comes from West African countries like Ivory Coast, Guinea, and Cameroon. In these countries, there aren't as many economic opportunities, which is the main reason for going to Europe. However, there are also refugees who are fleeing from the food insecurity, wars, and terrorism. Italy isn't the only country who is receiving these migrants from the Mediterranean. On this map, you can see that there are roughly three categories of sea routes. One from Turkey to Greece, one from North Africa to Italy, and another from North Africa to Spain and France. But because it's easiest to access, Italy is by far the most popular destination nowadays. However, there are still huge risks involved in crossing the Mediterranean Sea from Northern Africa. In 2023 alone, more than 2,500 boat migrants have died or gone missing at sea. At the height of the migration crisis in 2016, more than 5,000 people drowned crossing the sea. Despite this danger, many people still go aboard these fragile boats in search of a better life. 
This is not unique to the Mediterranean Sea, as it's also happening near the Canary Islands. This is a small piece of Spanish territory in the Atlantic Ocean, which is also experiencing record migration right now. This year alone, more than 32,000 people have arrived there. Similarly to Italy, majority of these people take a very dangerous journey with a real risk of getting lost in the ocean or getting shipwrecked. Needless to say, this issue of overseas migration is a very controversial one in the European politics. On one hand, people want to protect the vulnerable refugees, but on the other hand, the border countries don't want thousands of people illegally entering into their territory. To try and manage this, the European Union has created the Frontex organization. This agency is supposed to coordinate and lead efforts to manage the illegal migration. As you can see on this chart, it is rapidly growing and becoming one of the biggest EU agency. Right now, the budget is close to 1 billion euros. However, Frontex has also attracted a lot of criticism over the years. The organization was likely involved in controversial migrant pushbacks. It forced people fleeing to Greece to go back to Turkey, which is illegal under international law. Before you send people back, they have a right to an asylum process. But helping sea migrants cross the sea is also a controversial issue. There are many non-governmental organizations that rescue migrants who are crossing the sea. The Italian government doesn't like this because it could be a pull factor for more illegal immigration. When there are a lot of NGOs trying to rescue people, irregular migration could become easier. That's why the Italian government created a law to ban these organizations from doing multiple search and rescue missions in a row. This is supposed to slow down the NGOs. Recently, two rescue ships were detained for breaking this law. And this is not the only place where irregular migration has caused a political trouble. At the border between Poland and Belarus, it's even worse. The refugee crisis has been weaponized. Because Belarus is closely allied with Russia, it doesn't have good relations with the European Union. That's why it invented a scheme to put pressure on the EU by opening up yet another illegal migration route. Belarus took in thousands of refugees from Middle Eastern countries like Iraq to then send them to the Polish, Lithuanian, and Latvian borders. The basic idea of the Belarusian dictator Lukashenko was, and I quote, to flood the EU with drugs and migrants. By August 2023, 19,000 people already tried to enter the country that year. As a response, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia built border walls to protect their territory. This triggered a humanitarian crisis as the refugees were stuck at the border. Just south of Belarus, there is also a humanitarian crisis which is still ongoing. The war in Ukraine has displaced 8 million people within the country and 6 million have fled to other European countries. But for a couple of reasons, this didn't cause the same amount of turmoil as other migration has done. Nearly every member state supports Ukraine, which makes taking in Ukrainian refugees relatively easy. Poland stepped in to take in the largest number of Ukrainians, which is estimated 1.6 million refugees living in the country. This country is usually very critical of migration, but the situation in Ukraine was an exception. For one, the migration coming from Ukraine is hopefully of a temporary nature. The men have all stayed to fight, and many of the refugees would like to go back once the war is over. There is still no end in sight right now, but the war won't go on forever. Second of all, the sheer proximity of the war makes Europeans feel very involved in the situation. A war right at the EU's border feels different than a war on another continent. There are many cultural similarities between Ukrainians and other Europeans. Especially for right-wing parties, this cultural element is very important in deciding who to take in. Now that we know some historical background, we can move on to some of the political factors that play a role in this issue. There are many upsides to immigration, especially in Europe. Because the continent is facing an unprecedented fertility rate collapse, immigration is needed to prevent a total population collapse. With a fertility rate of just 1.5, Europe is in for a tough future when we look at its demographics. Every generation will shrink by 25%, causing huge shortages in the labor market. In the European Union, there will be 35 million less people within the working age by 2050. Eventually, this could lead to businesses leaving Europe, causing an economic downturn. Because the fertility rates have a delayed effect, it's already too late to prevent this from happening. The people that are supposed to replace the huge boomer generation in Europe should have been born right now. But the problem is, they haven't. 
We can see this very clearly in the population pyramids of European countries. There is a huge group of people aged 30 to 60 who are about to retire over the coming decades. However, the next generation is significantly smaller, which will cause huge problems. For one, the entire retirement system is headed for collapse if this continues. The younger generation is never going to be able to pay for the retirement of such a huge amount of retirees. Second of all, the economy of Europe will enter decades of recession. This is pretty obvious when you cut it down to the essentials. If you have less people to produce and consume goods, your economy shrinks. Europe is already falling behind the US economically, and the demographic crisis will only make it worse. Even though the US also has lowering birth rates, its population pyramid is still relatively healthy. This means that America will probably have way more consumers and workers in the future, and in turn, a much larger economy. In fact, this has already happened over the last decade and a half. In 2008, the EU had a bigger GDP at purchasing power than the US, with 16.2 trillion versus 14.7 trillion. 15 years later, the United States has an economy one third bigger than the EU and UK combined. It's now $25 trillion against $19.8 trillion. Freedom, baby. Anyways, one factor in Europe losing its competitiveness could be the low birth rates. We can also see the clear economic effects of demographics when we go further back in time. In 1950, the population pyramid of Europe was still shaped like an actual pyramid. Conversely, this was the golden age of capitalism where Western Europe experienced incredible economic growth. From 1950 to 1970, the only country which grew its economy faster was Japan. Although demographics weren't the only factor, they definitely played a role in this success. And this is why the population collapse is giving the European leaders a lot of headaches. Currently, the European governments only see one solution for this issue, and that is immigration. Getting new people from outside can help to mitigate the population crisis in the short term. Many countries in Asia and Africa still have high birth rates, which means they have enough people to come to Europe. One of the examples of this policy is what Meloni's government is doing in Italy. Our right-wing party is very opposed to immigration, as are many Italians. However, to fill the enormous labor gap, she is pushing for legal immigration from outside the EU. Our government plans to file 425,000 work permits between now and 2025 all for non-EU citizens. This is to ease off the labor shortage, which is currently at about 1 million according to estimates by the Italian government. All over Europe, the shortages have gotten worse over the years. The job vacancy rate has more than doubled over the last 10 years, meaning that there are two times more unoccupied job positions. In Austria, Belgium, and Netherlands, the labor situation is one of the worst. There are roughly two different kinds of jobs that are needed, highly skilled workers and people for low paying jobs. In highly developed countries, there is often a lack of people to work in sectors like construction, manufacturing or agriculture. Because these positions have relatively low pay, it's not that attractive to work in. However, it's relatively easy to get people from other countries for these jobs. But there is also a rising labor shortage in jobs in healthcare, IT and engineering sectors. For these roles, it's much harder to get people from abroad. Still, the EU is planning to attract more skilled labor. It wants to support companies when looking for foreign workers, accept qualifications from other countries, and provide more learning opportunities for immigrants. In this way, immigration could also fill the skilled labor gap and help Europe's economy forward. However, many Europeans also think that there are many negative effects of immigration. The biggest issue is integration which basically means how well a person can blend into a society. When someone gets a job, goes to a school, and learns how to speak the language, the integration is fairly successful. Most of the immigrants fall under this category, but there is a minority of immigrants that is causing a lot of trouble. When integration fails, it can lead to social unrest and rising crime rates. One of the best examples where this is happening is Sweden. Not too long ago, it was one of the safest countries in Europe falling in line with many other Scandinavian countries. Now, it is the second most violent country in Europe when it comes to gun violence, only behind Albania. The overwhelming majority of the violence is done by gangs that have emerged in poor neighborhoods. 
These urban areas are also known as Utsata. All have high concentrations of second and third generation immigrants from countries like Syria and Morocco. They have very poor socioeconomic conditions with high unemployment and low levels of education. This shows that there is a serious problem with integration in Sweden, as these new people often don't get a job or go to school. Especially in the second generation of immigrants, the problems start to show. To provide some data, the relative rate of robbery among Swedes with two foreign-born parents is 1050% more than ethnic Swedes. The rate of murder is 1020% higher and the rate of burglary is 400% higher. So, it's indisputable that integration failure is causing problems. In Swedish politics, there is a clear divide about what should be done about these issues. The left-leaning parties say that poor socioeconomic conditions should be solved first because they are the root cause of all the violence. It's true that when immigrants receive good education and get decently paying jobs, the integration process goes much smoother. During the government led by the Social Democrat Party, promoting this was the active policy in Sweden. However, the idea has lost a lot of support over the last few years. In the 2022 election, the center-left coalition suffered a defeat partly because of immigration and crime issues. The party that gained most of the votes was the right-wing Sweden Democrat Party, which is very strongly against immigration. It has formed a majority with other right and center parties to form a center-right government. As a result, Sweden's immigration policy took a U-turn. Right now, the government is looking at laws to deport asylum seekers and immigrants for criminal activities or for not conforming with Swedish values. This is another way of solving the growing problem with integration, but not a very subtle one. We can see the same problems starting to form in France. Much like the Utsata in Sweden, it has poor suburbs with high concentration of immigrants. These areas are called Banlui. I probably mispronounced that horribly, but these are some of the poorest regions in the country. They can easily be recognized by boring concrete flats serving as public housing. The biggest ones are in Paris, but you can also see them in smaller cities like Lyon and Marseille. These areas are similar to the ghettos in the United States because there is a lot of violence between the police and the residents. During the huge riots in France a few months ago, these areas had the worst fighting in the country. This resulted in the death of a teenager of North African descent because a police officer shot him without reason. But even before this year's riots though, there was already a lot of police brutality in this area. Something that goes hand in hand with this is high crime rates. The immigrants in these areas commit more crimes than the native population. In 2022, 69% of all violent crimes and robberies in the greater Paris region were committed by foreign nationals. Nationwide, this figure was about 55%. Immigrants originating from Africa have committed about 42% of violent crimes, while they are only 3.2% of the population. This has its roots in the impoverished conditions that they have lived under in the left behind suburbs. If one thing, it shows that integration of newcomers is failing. On the part of the French government, it was a bad idea to put all these immigrants in the same neighborhoods. When they are segregated from the rest of the society, the integration thing is obviously not going to succeed, especially when there are not that many job opportunities. However, there are also legitimate concerns whether the overall amount of immigrants was asking too much. Some people think that there is a limit to how many people a society can successfully integrate. The right-wing party National Rally thinks that this limit has been already reached. And it's the biggest party in the polls. Between right and left-wing parties, there is a lot of division on how to solve the growing migration problems. Recently, the centrist Macron government tried to put forward an immigration bill, which was rejected by both the right and the left. The bill had things that supported both right-wing and left-wing ideas, but the parties didn't want to make any compromises. The bill would have shortened the asylum process and regulate undocumented workers in sectors with labor shortages. The right-wing party said that something like this would just invite more immigration into the country. On top of that, the bill would have also introduced an annual quota for migration and give the police the right to expel foreigners who commit crimes. To this point, the left-wing party said that this goes against the fundamental values of the republic. Since Macron has a minority government, this centrist proposal did not work out. Apart from the integration issues, 
there is another downside of immigration, the rise of terrorism. Over the last two decades, there has been an uptick in Islamic terrorist attacks in many European countries. France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, among others, have all suffered multiple jihadist attacks. The worst ones were the 2004 Madrid train bombings, killing 193 people and injuring more than 2,000. Another attack that is remembered to this day were the 2015 Paris attacks. Multiple suicide bombers and shooters from the Islamic State attacked a soccer stadium, cafes, and a theater during a series of coordinated attacks. Attack killed 130 and injured 416. It was carried out by immigrants including ones with Iraqi, Syrian, and Moroccan descent. There were also numerous anti-Semitic attacks including the 2014 shooting in the Jewish Museum of Belgium. The attack was done by an Algerian and a Syrian man who fled from Syrian civil war. All of these terrorist attacks are just to name a few. And the problems last to this day. Only in the last few weeks, a German tourist was killed near the Eiffel Tower and a French teacher got stabbed to death. There were also many instances of terrorist plots being discovered and prevented by the police. Just recently, German police arrested multiple jihadists planning to attack some of the country's Christmas markets. In general, the risk of terrorist attacks has risen a lot because of the conflict in Israel and Palestine. The MI5 in the United Kingdom is considering raising the danger level from substantial to critical, making a terrorist attack highly likely. France is also heightening security because of the large terrorist threat. Although the total number of people killed by terrorism in Europe is fairly low, it still creates a lot of public fear. Most Europeans think that taking in more refugees increases the likelihood of a terrorist attack. Finishing this topic, it's fair to mention that overwhelming majority of refugees are not radicalized terrorists at all. But there are a few bad apples in the mix, which ruin it for everyone. It's also related to the integration issue because the people joining terrorist groups are often first and second generation immigrants who have trouble blending into society. After hearing all this, you can probably tell that there is a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the future of European migration issue. With the continued rise in labor shortages and skill shortages, European governments will be forced to have some amount of immigration. This is needed to save businesses from leaving and ruining the economy. If Europe wants to stay competitive with the United States and China, accepting newcomers will be the only solution. But politically speaking, it's not clear what the migration limit should be. The rise of crime and the integration failure is making immigration difficult to sell to the public. As the problems are getting worse in countries like Sweden and France, right-wing anti-immigration parties are getting more and more support across Europe. When right-wing parties get more and more influence in the European Union, the border policies will probably get stricter. Many of these existing routes for irregular migration could be closed. The legal ways to get into Europe could also get much harder once the governments start imposing stricter limits. Another uncertain factor is the instability in many African and Middle Eastern countries that could trigger refugee streams to Europe. Conflicts similar to one in Syria could have dramatic effects, resulting in situations like the one in 2015. In fact, there's already conflict happening right now with the potential to cause mass migration. The war in Sudan, which is covered way too little on the news, has already displaced 6.3 million people since April. We have a video on this topic coming very soon, so be sure to hit the subscribe button down below so you don't miss it. Hundreds of thousands of Sudanese fled to Egypt, which sits right next to the Mediterranean Sea. On top of this, there are also fears that the region of West Africa could have devastating wars because of bad economic circumstances, civil unrest, young and growing population, the risk of conflict is extremely high. We have seen a taste of this during the recent coup in Niger. If a situation like this deteriorates, we could see millions of people to be displaced. Many of them will take their chances and flee to Europe. So it's not the question if a situation like 2015 will happen again, but it's the question of when. To prepare for this, the European Union has new rules for crisis regulation. The border countries will be allowed to keep migrants at the border for 20 weeks to examine whether they can get asylum or not. There is also a system for dividing the number of refugees among EU member states. Countries can accept their share of migrants, pay 20,000 euros for each migrants they refuse, or finance the operational support. 
Hopefully, this set of rules will prevent the whole system from falling apart like it did in 2015 and 2016. Lastly, I'm a big believer in the thinking that your life experiences shape the opinions you have. I think the toughest immigration question not just in Europe but all around the world is the question of asylum seekers. As someone who has only lived in peaceful countries all his life, I don't really know what it feels like to run from a war. But I also understand that any country, whether it be in Europe or in North America, just cannot accept unlimited amount of immigrants. And that's the big question. The big question is, where is that line? And that's the whole point behind making this video, so people can become more informed on the topic. And hopefully in the comments, you guys can teach us something that we missed in the video.